know, here we are just a few days now before the end of the year and the start of a new year. On the 8th or 9th of January, our students will become, begin coming back on campus to register for the second semester. Classes begin on Wednesday, January the 11th, which is Lindsay's and my 26th wedding anniversary. I'll be speaking in the first chapel that morning uh, on Wednesday the 11th when the classes resume again. And one of the things that we enjoy doing on this program is bring you selected highlights from chapel services. Just a couple of weeks ago, Lindsay brought a tremendous message uh, uh, titled Seven Ups in Your Life. Not seven downs, but seven ups in your life. And I want to share that with you on the program with me tonight. So go with me up to Christ Chapel. All the students and faculty are gathered as Lindsay is giving seven ups for your life. All right, everybody say seven up. Title of my message today is Seven Ups. Seven things to lift up your life. Seven things that you can do in your life to lift your life up to the kingdom of God. Now, there's a couple ways we can approach this. There's a gospel according to do and there's a gospel according to don't. I can stand up here and tell you that I don't approve of this and I don't approve of that and some of you approve of it and do it and some of you don't approve of it and don't do it. But I can't be your policeman. I am not called by God to be your watchdog. I'm not going to come into your dorm room and tell you to take the stupid Xbox that you've been playing for 25,000 hours and not doing your homework, or I'm not going to tell you about your online casino gambling, and I'm not going to tell you about your drinking and bringing other kids on campus to put them in your room and lock them in your room and party till the cows come home. Now, I could do that, but why would I waste my time because a person changed against his will is of the same opinion still. It's your choice, it's your will. So what am I doing standing up here with seven up? I'm standing up here to give you an alternative to choose. I used to sit with my kids and I would make a decision of the clothing that I would buy for them when they were little tiny, but then I'd go into their room and when it was time for them to get dressed, I'd give them seven or eight choices because I felt like it was responsible decision-making time. Even though they were two or three years old, they needed to make quality decisions for themselves. How would they dress in a certain situation? If mama's not always going to be there, then my job as mama, the Bible talks about discipline. Discipline doesn't mean you beat the trash out of your kids. Discipline means you make a disciple out of by your training. My job was to train up a child in the way he should go, and then when mama's not there, he won't depart from it. So there's lots of situations that you're going to face. There's lots of things that you're going to do and not do. There's temptations. That, it's all out there. I'm not going to stand with you in the dark and say, don't do that. Because my job is to put enough of God into your heart that you are making quality decisions and you have disciplined yourself to make a decision for Jesus Christ. And you know, the bottom line is, if you go and do really wacko things, I'm not totally held responsible. I'm held responsible to a degree as you're covering. But once I've done my job, the rest lays in your lap. And so what I'd like to do today is present seven things that you could look at. And I want to make it simple. You know me well enough to know that I'm not going to give you some com huge, complicated, deep theology that even I don't understand. I'm going to tell you seven simple things. The choice is yours to do these seven simple things or to throw them in the trash can. I can't make you do them. There are people in this, in, in this university that I've seen here that I know what you do on the weekends. I've seen you do it in high school. And why you're even at this school is a mystery to me. But I got you. So as long as I've got you, I'm going to try and keep you. And I'm going to try and work with you. And I want to bring you Jesus so big that you make a decision that Jesus is bigger than any other choice that you make. My job is not to beat you over the head with a God stick. Because a person changed against his will is of the same opinion still. And when I leave the room, my choices will go out of the room with me. What I want to do is present the gospel to you in such a way that you begin to make those choices. Number one, pray up. I want you to start each day with prayer. I want you to end each day with prayer. And I want you to pray all the time in the middle. You mean that's possible? Why would I want to do that? Let me tell you something. Satan is coming around as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Whether it's the morning, the middle of the day, the afternoon, the night, the middle of the night. He doesn't pick quality time that you get a chance to pray because he's coming at 12.02. Satan is coming as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He may try to devour you in the form of discouragement and despair. 
care. Maybe the way you study, maybe the way you, you can't focus, or maybe the way your brain thinks and you just can't get a grip on things. Maybe he's coming to you in the form of a very cute girl. Maybe he's coming to you in the form of a very cute guy. Maybe he's coming to you in the form of both. Reality. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities, and rulers of darkness, and against spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the whole armor of God that you may stand your day in the evil day. After you've done everything to stand, stand for with the belt of truth with on uh, the breastplate of righteousness, with your feet shod, with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Take on the shield of faith for which you can quench all existing flaming arrows from the evil one. Take on the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep praying. Pray for me also. This is what I'm asking you. Pray for me, Lindsay, also, that whenever I open my mouth, the words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mysteries of the gospel. I have a job to do, and I need to do it without worrying what you think of me. Number two, show up. Number one, pray up. Number two, show up. Make decisions, quality decisions, to go places on purpose. Make decisions where you go and make quality decisions where you don't go. Proverbs 19:21. Many are the plans of a man's heart, but it is the purpose of God that shall prevail. Do things on purpose, for a purpose, with a purpose, with the purpose of God in mind. Joshua 24:15. Choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we choose to serve the Lord. There are places that you're going and things that you're doing that may be really, really, really good things, but are they God things? The difference between a good idea, G-O-O-D, and a God idea, G-O-D, is only one O, but that O will kill you if you're not careful. Number two, show up. If, God, if Satan can't make you bad, he will make you busy. I don't have time to go to church. I don't have time to go there. I don't have time to do this. You know, sometimes you feel like you're one of those little hamsters on the wheel that's going round and round and round and round and round. And, and, and the best thing somebody can do is grab a hold of that wheel and just tell you to stop. Just stop. Take a breath. Breathe. God said the steps of a righteous man are ordered of him. Did you ask God what were your marching orders this morning? Or did you decide to make the plan? And in the middle of the plan, you tell God to bless your plan. God isn't going to bless your plan. God blesses his plan. We need to get on his plan. It's already blessed. I've sat in this chapel and watched people fold their arms and not worship the Lord, not sing one song, not pray one prayer, not close their eyes, not listen to anything, and put their arms folded as if they are going to get me. Let me tell you something in the name of Jesus. I have prayed for you to be in this place. I have prayed for you to be in this place. So anything that you can do, I can pray better. Is that a pompous prayer? No. That's a prayer to get your face on this carpet before the kingdom of God so that you go to heaven. That's the nicest prayer I can ever pray for you, is a prayer that I can say, my Father God will one day be a part of your heart. I'm not praying you out. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm praying you in. Because I believe the only chance I have to get you into God's kingdom is to keep you here. And I love you enough with the love of the Lord to stand here and take the hits of whatever it takes to love you into the kingdom of God. Because for God so loved the world. God is love, and we're to be like God. And love never fails. I love you enough to take the hits, to stand strong, and say, I do not want you to leave. It's hard to go to hell. God did not set up heaven to send you to hell. God wants you in heaven, and it's hard to miss heaven. It's hard to go to hell. But there are people trying with all their might, and I'm trying with all my might to get you to go into God's kingdom. Number two, show up where you belong. Number three, now, I could say this in an ugly way, or I could say it in a nice way, and I'm going to say it in a nice way. Hush up. 
I could say shut up, but I'm going to say hush up. Because there is a time to talk, and then there's a time to listen. The Bible says in Proverbs 4.20, David said to his son Solomon, he said, my son, give attention to my words. Incline your ears to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of, their, of your heart, for their life to those who find them, and they are health to all their flesh. If you listen to God's word, it becomes life and health. If you're sick and if you're down and if you're depressed, my son, give attention to my words. There is a time to be still. Psalms 46.10 says, be still and know that I am God. Now there is also not just a time to hush up, there is a time to speak up. Number four, speak up. Mark 11, 23 and 24 says that you're supposed to speak to your mountain and command it to obey you. Speak to the mountain, tell it what to do. So many times we talk to our mountain. God did not tell you to talk to your mountain. He didn't tell you to or talk about your mountain. He didn't say all oh, this, all oh, that. Oh, my professor's this, my roommate's that. Okay. There is a time for you to change what you say. Because we say what we have, but the Bible says that's not the way to do it. We can have what we say. Begin to speak as a man says out of his mouth, so is he. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth begins to speak. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Stop speaking death to your roommate. Stop speaking death to your study habits. Stop speaking death to your professors. Stop speaking death to your president. Begin to speak life in the name of Jesus. Maybe you don't like the dress code. Neither do I. But you know what? It brings you into submission and it brings you into authority. And it brings you into a learning experience of discipline. Make a disciple out of you by training. We could come on this campus and look a different way. We could go on this campus and not study. We could go on this campus and not preach. We could do a lot of things. But if this is the way that the Lord has directed him, there's two words we need to say, yes, sir. Because that brings us into submission and subjection to the word of God as he's under God's authority. And if you disagree, get on your face and pray. Because I'll tell you something, many times when I can't get him to listen to me, God can. I'm not being sarcastic. There are things that it's not my place to say. It's God's place. So you know what I do? I get on my face and I speak the word of God over my husband and he speaks the word of God over me. And I believe that prayer does begin to soften hearts and God has an ability to speak to those who will listen. So there's a time to speak up. And when you speak up, be sure you're speaking the word of God and not speaking death into a situation when you should be speaking life. And be sure that you're not speaking life into a situation when you should be cursing it at the root. There's people I prayed out of here that I should have prayed in. There's people I prayed in here I should have prayed out. It's real simple. So what do you do? You begin to speak the word of God. And as you speak God's word, God watches over his word to perform it. Begin to call things that be not as though they are. If you can't learn in a certain subject, Father God, I have the mind of Christ and I ask you to heal my brain in Jesus' name. If your body and your finances aren't lining up with the word of God, sow your seed and in the name of Jesus, expect a harvest. And as you begin to speak the word of God, stop speaking about the problem and start speaking to it. And then you speak to it with the word of God, there'll be a change. Number five, cheer up. Number one was pray up. Number two, show up. Number three, hush up when it's time to be still and know that he's God. Number four, speak up when it's the right time to speak up. And number five, cheer up. I believe our attitude determines our altitude. And I also believe with all of my heart that depression and oppression is one of the greatest tricks of the devil in this century. And we get, what, maybe a couple thousand phone calls a day at the Abundant Life Prayer Group? How much? 3,000 phone calls a day at the Abundant Life Prayer Group. Now, if you're getting 3,000 phone calls every day from around the world, you get a little bit of a finger on some of the issues that people are facing today. Probably the biggest one is finances, and one of the next one in line is depression. I really believe with all my heart that Satan is using circumstances to kill God's people. And he said you could renew your mind daily with the word of God. The soul realm is the mind, the will, and the emotions. The suke, the Bible calls it. That mind, will, and emotions is very, 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 very susceptible to the word of God. But it's also susceptible to fear and torment and torture. 
And it's very easy to slide into oppression and depression. But God said you can have the mind of Christ. He said begin to choose this day whom you'll serve. Yes, you can't just walk around going, I choose, I choose, if you are in a state where Satan has attacked you. But counterattack. Begin to renew your mind daily with the Word of God. Nehemiah 8.10, the joy of the Lord is your strength. There are days when I don't have strength, and I don't have joy, and I don't think anything's funny, and I'm so exhausted I can't crawl out of bed. But I call on the name of the Lord and ask for His joy and His strength to come into my physical body and to renew me according to His Word. And some days that's all I have. Some days I think I'm only going on heart. But it's okay, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth begins to speak, and I speak the Word of God, and my circumstances begin to change. Number six look up. Number six, look up. Psalm 121, 1 through 4 says, look up to the hills for which cometh your help. Sometimes we look to the wrong things. We look to the wrong people. We go to the phone before we go to the throne. And we begin to put all of our stock in people. And then people let you down. And then when people let you down, you begin to get down. And sometimes you get so low, they would have to literally jack you up to bury you. And I'm telling you, that's not God. Be careful who you're looking up to. I know of a young man that, that, I, that I've talked to over and over and over, that I just helped him out of drug rehab. And God loved his precious angel heart. The first thing out of his mouth was, people looked up to me. And he said, and I took them to parties. Where would they be if I took them to church instead of parties? And he said, I'm going to go make it right. And I see him doing that. Number seven, hook up. Number seven, hook up. Number one, pray up. Number two, show up. Number three, hush up. Number four, speak up. Number five, cheer up. Number six, look up. Number seven, hook up. Philippians 4, 13 through 19 is the account of Paul talking to the church at Philippi when he used the word joint partakers. He used the word that they had become partners. They joined together in partnership. And he said, basically, now my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, because you've partnered with me and with my God in the ministry that God sent me to do. So once you get a hook up and you get a partnership together, you get and appropriate what they have. Um, as you receive the prophet, the Bible says, you also receive the prophet's reward. Whatever you hook up with, you become tied to. When you become tied to it, you become guilty by association. You may be guilty of more blessing because you've blessed someone. You may be guilty of more cursing because you've cursed someone. Whatever you hook up with and become a joint partaker in partnership with, you become. That's very clear in the Bible. Soul ties are very clear in the Bible. Be careful who you tie your mind, your will, and your emotions to. Because if they're going to China and you're sitting at home, you wonder why suddenly you feel like you're in China. You have soul tied yourself to someone, and if you need to break that this has to be done in the spirit so that everywhere they go good bad or somewhere indifferent you don't go with them because God may want you to be soul tied to a partner for life but you better decide that it's God that chooses it and not you because nobody you read the book of Proverbs nobody can take you to hell faster than the wrong person you're hooked up with that's why God said don't be unevenly yoked do you know what that word yoke when God said his yoke is easy and his burden is light how many of you have ever hooked up a team of oxen or a team of horses like Clydesdales I have you know what a yoke around their neck is when a yoke around their neck is that great big round circle thing, it's kind of an oval that, that looks like they're breaking their neck, but in, instead they're actually saving the horse's neck. They put a yoke around the horse's neck and then they tie it to the team, and each team, uh, each horse in the team is tied together strategically, and then there's a driver. If one horse goes ahead of the other, the weaker horse will go in another dimension, the stronger horse will be the one to get its neck broken. It's always that way. When a yoke says it's easy, he said my yoke is easy, it doesn't mean simple. It actually translates it fits. When a yoke fits around a horse or an oxen's neck, it protects the animal from getting its neck broken. When one gets out of line, and God said don't be unevenly yoked, when one gets out of line, 
It's not the one out of line that breaks its neck. It breaks the person or the, or the animal's neck that's actually in line. When you yoke yourself to someone who gets out of line, it doesn't break their neck, it breaks yours. God wants us to be evenly yoked so you don't end up destroying yourself. Hook up. Partnership means joint partaker. When you become a partner with someone, emotionally, sexually, spiritually, whatever, you are a joint partaker in whatever it is they do or they've been doing. Why do you think sexually transmitted diseases are transmitted? Because of a partnership, a hooking up. And it's so sad that in this day we don't recognize the honest-to-God devastation that's happening with things like HIV. It's time for us to wake up. That's not part of this message, but number seven hookup also means wake up. Genesis 4-9, am I my brother's keeper? Answer, yes. Proverbs 18-24 uh, talks about a friend that sticks closer than a brother. A man can have many friends. To have many friends, you must show yourself friendly. But there is a friend in Jesus that sticks closer than a brother. When Jesus talks about being a friend, we only have one Bible. In school, I don't know how many books you have, but when you go through the course of a, a four-year college term, you've got tons of books. But Jesus only saw that he's in a, a handful of chapters, mostly in the New Testament, in one book. And one of the names that Jesus has is friend. A lot of people say that they're friends with people. A lot of people say that, oh, I hooked up with these friends. When you hook up with these friends, what are you hooking yourself up to? Are they pulling you up spiritually? Are they pulling you into the wrong crowd? Are they pulling you into destruction and devastation? Are they pulling you into Satanism? Are they pulling you into godlyism? What are you hooking up with? You are to hook up. You are to hook up with other godly people. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. But when you hook up, are they pulling you up? Are they pulling you down? Are you pulling someone else up or down? I have a letter I want to read to you to answer that question. I know this person. This person, 18 years old. I've known him since he was about mm, four foot three and, uh, and, and watched him play basketball at a Christian school right here in town. Very, 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 let me say it again, very, very, very strong Christian young man. Very strong. Did I say that clearly? A very strong Christian young man. Seventh grade, I watched him play basketball. He was phenomenal. Straight A student. Earning my mom's trust and respect. I know I've lost the trust and respect from my mom who I love so much due to the fact that I lied, I cheated, stolen, and I plain disrespected her. I plan to gain back this by obeying my parents and obeying government laws also. I plan to get a job as soon as I get out of here. And as time goes, I believe that God will restore our relationship and our trust. I feel horrible for the things I've done, which I, I wish I could erase them, but I can't. And all I can do is try to fix it and make it better. So as time goes on, now listen to this statement. Wow, this was some statement. I can look back on this as a temporary inconvenience for a permanent improvement. Mom, I love you so dearly, and I'm sorry for the hurt that I've caused. I love you more than you'll ever know. You are the sunshine of my life. Next letter, this is my life. I've screwed up over and over. It started when I was 15. I started smoking and getting in with the cool crowd. My parents noticed my problem and decided to send me to boarding school. I spent one year and one week there. I thought I was now ready to do what God had planned for me, but fell short and got caught up in the same crowd. There's that word again. And it got worse off than before. May 28, 2005, I was arrested for possession and paraphernalia. I got the case dismissed, but then I got arrested again on Saturday, September 24th. I'm still in jail, but I plan to go home Friday, September 30th. I'm planning on getting a job as soon as I get out of here to pay my dad back for the expenses I've cost for getting into my trouble. Hopefully, I can go back to school. But if not, I'll get my GED and start at TCC. I plan to study and become a dentist. I want to be a dentist and have a good life away from drugs and sin. I plan to pick a new group of friends because the ones I have, because the ones I have, because the ones I have aren't helping me achieve my goals in life. Because the ones I have aren't helping me achieve my goals in life. It's sad that it took this for me 
to give my life back to God. I've had so much mercy and grace, and I know God will intervene, intervene in this too, at this time too. I need to remember that the God that I asked to save me is forever and always here for me. That was written Friday night as he was released from jail. Saturday, his friends picked him up and took him to a party. Ten Xanax bars later, he wasn't acting right. He was a little bit too down. So they thought that they'd jack him back up a little bit more by giving methylamphetamine. That'll do it. Cardiac arrest later, they just put him in bed. And they left him there. And then about an hour, I get to go bury him. Yeah, he had a heart attack and he died and he just turned 18. And I sat with his mom and I think I was more of a mess than she was. I can't decide because both of us were trash. And we cried and we cried and we cried and we cried and every letter that he gave her had to do with friends. Yeah, his friends did stick closer than a brother. In fact, they called each other brothers. Now they call each other dead. Nobody took him to the hospital. Nobody called 911. Nobody wanted to get involved. Oh, they were really involved in giving it to him. The problem was they weren't really involved in helping him when he was in cardiac arrest. Yeah, you are your brother's keeper. But what are you keeping him doing? You don't want to be me in an hour. You really don't. When I got his letters and I got his picture, I just started throwing up. I couldn't think of anything else to do. And there's something inside your human body that rejects death so much that it repulses you and you just want to throw up. So I've been throwing up ever since I got this. And you understand it happened this past weekend. I'm not going to go in your dorm room. I'm not going to go to any parties or clubs with you. I'm not going to hunt you down like a dog on a mission. I'm not going to go where your friends are. I'm not even going to ask you who your friends are. You're a grown-up now. Ask yourself. But as your friends are presenting the parties, so fun. If I can't present an alternative that means more to you than the parties, then I've not done my job. And I'll be honest with you, I feel like a complete failure. I don't feel like I did my job with my little friend. No, I take that back. I know I didn't do my job because he's dead. I'm not your cop, but I am your friend. And I'm asking you to stick close to here and stick close to me and stick close to the gospel and stick close to people who look like they need help. And if you're helping them go to hell, reevaluate. Help them go the other direction. And if you can't do that, at least be gentleman and lady enough not to call them a friend. Acquaintance, maybe. But don't call them your friend. And don't call them brother. Please don't, please don't, excuse me for the word, but please don't bastardize the word friend as my Savior used it. And please don't bastardize the word brother as my Savior used it. Be honest enough to call them your enemy, but don't call them your friend. And be honest enough with yourself to look in the dorm rooms next to you and say, is there anything I can do as I search my heart to get that one to Jesus? Is there anything I can do to help make their life better? Leanne, come on up here a minute. And all singers, come on back up here with me. I was kind of going through the emotion of this yesterday, and I took a bunch of kids to dinner with me. And one of them talked about some of the abuse that they had been through in their life and how, how very difficult it was to reach her. In fact, she said almost nothing could crack the shell because the words didn't matter anymore. When you've been abused as a child, things don't matter. Words are very hard to get in. You're a hard-hearted, hardened person from that moment on until someone begins to soften you and until the love of God begins to soften you. And so I finally said, you know, I, I, if, you, if you're calling yourself, in a sense, a hard nut to crack, what began to soften you? She said, nobody preaching. I said, okay. What began to soften you? And she said, worship. 
She said, where no words could go into my soul, worship began to go into my soul. So we have, let's say, five minutes. And I don't want to give you what the Bible says, enticing words of man's wisdom. I don't have any right now. My enticing words, my wisdom is basically in the toilet right now. I got nothing to say. I feel like a portion of me is a tremendous failure. But I know this, the God that I serve can come into your heart and permeate your soul because he said he inhabits, lives and dwells in the praises of his people. So I want to begin to worship God right now. And as we do, I want you to reevaluate. And maybe you're doing great. And if you are, thank you, Jesus. But if you're doing great to whom much has been given, much is required, pass that on to somebody who's hurting. Please don't.